This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Thank, uh, thanks for coming. It's my pleasure today to introduce Mark Danner, who was born in Utica, New York. After graduating with an interdisciplinary degree in modern literatures and aesthetics from Harvard, he began working as an editorial assistant at the New York Review of Books. Just three years later, he became senior editor at Harper's Magazine, and then after two years, moved on to an editorship at the New York Times Magazine, where he mostly wrote about politics and foreign affairs. In 1990, Mark published a three-part series at the New in the New Yorker titled A Reporter at Large, Beyond the Mountains. These three articles about Haiti were awarded the 1990 National Magazine Award for Reporting. Shortly after that, he joined the New Yorker staff. In 1993, the magazine, for only the second time in its history, devoted an entire issue to one story, which was written by Mark, The Truth of El Mozote. This article about the infamous massacre of the entire population of a Salvadorian village, some 700 men, women, and children, by an army unit trained by American military advisors, exploded the Reagan administration's position on the said event that nothing at all had happened in El Mazote, uh, certainly no massacre. And if you believe that sort of thing, you were being a victim of leftist propaganda. The story won an Overseas Press Club Award and a Latin American Studies Association Award. In 1994, Mark published a book based on this article, The Massacre at El Mazote, A Parable of the Cold War. The New York Times wrote, once in a rare while, a writer re-examines a debated episode of recent history with such thoroughness and integrity that the truth can no longer be in doubt. Since then, Mark has brought that same thoroughness and integrity to his writing about war and conflict in regions as varied as Central America, Haiti, the Balkans, Iraq, and the Middle East. His books include Torture and Truth, America, Abu Ghraib, and the War on Terror. Um, the Secret Way to War, which is subtitled The Downing Street Memo and the Iraq War's Buried History, and Stripping Bare the Body, Bolit Politics, Violence, War. His work has appeared in Harper's, The New York Times, uh, Aperture Magazine, The New York Review of Books, The Washington Post, and many other newspapers and magazine. His honors include a National Magazine Award, three overseas press awards, and an Emmy. He has been named a MacArthur, MacArthur Fellow, that you will remember is the Genius Award, and was awarded the Kerry McWilliams Award from the American Political Science Association for, I quote, his major journalistic contribution to our understanding of politics. He is currently a professor here at Berkeley and also spends half the year at Bar Bard College in New York as a professor of foreign affairs, politics, and the humanities. In June of this year, he'll publish a new book, Torture and the Forever War, which describes and investigates the torture of Guantanamo detainee Abu Zabayada, and in doing so forces us to face the conditions and the continuing intellectual and moral evasions which, that have allowed the United States to become a country that officially and openly tortures. In Massacre at El Mozote, a carrier diplomat offers an explanation for the Reagan administration's careful distancing of itself from the frontline consequences of the policies it has set in motion. He says, it's a dirty little war and they don't want to touch it. Over the last 25 years, Mark's work, work has brought home to us the realities of all the dirty little wars none of us want to touch. Susan Sontag correctly described his writing as admirable and necessary. It is also, I think, courageous, co graceful, and compassionate. Please join me in welcoming Mark Danner. Thank you very much, Vikram, for that beautiful introduction. I'm, I'm very grateful. 
I always wish my mother was here when I get an introduction like that. Um, <laughs> and thank you, Beverly, for inviting me. Um, I'm just delighted to be here uh, at Story Hour. Uh, and thank you all for coming on this absolutely uh, beautiful, transportingly beautiful day. Um, you know, when I was invited to uh, come, uh, I just thought of the associations of, of Story Hour, which is, you know, people gathered around in this close and beautiful room, uh, listening to gorgeous stories, uh, uplifting stories, lovely stories. And I thought, I don't have any of those. <laughs> I just have sort of blood and torture and all the stuff that uh, Vikram just described. And um, I, I dedicated this last, this last book, uh, Stripping Bear of the Body, to my, um, to my mother uh, with the words, uh, uh, to my mother in partial answer to her persistent question, why can't you go somewhere nice for a change? <laughs> And um, th this spring, I'm going somewhere nice, or at least I told her I was earlier in the spring uh, uh, to uh, Athens. And uh, so, of course, Athens has started to be the scene of riots and burning and all the rest of it. And uh, is that a little narcissistic? I don't know. <laughs> um, in any case, um, I, having thought about it a little more and trying to think of uplifting things, I finally, during the last couple of weeks, and particularly the last week during uh, the public debate that we've been having, insofar as you can call it a debate about Iran and Israel, Iran and nuclear weapons, uh, President Obama saying that his policy when it comes to Iran is not containment, which is to say all options are on the table uh, to prevent them acquiring a nu nuclear weapon, weapon, including, of course, the use of force. Uh, and the braying on the Republican side from the Republican campaign about uh, why hasn't he struck them yet. Um, uh, having heard this uh, discussion, if one could call it that, I thought, oh, what the hell, I'll, I'll read uh, some of my work about uh, various wars and various so-called dark places. And with the excuse, I suppose, that um, our most distinctive quality, I think, is a polity, as a great power, as a superpower, as we like to call ourselves, it seems to me is the power to forget. Uh, we have, the, have a power of uh, blithe forgetting. And, um, and we tend to uh, send our troops into these places, go into these places, as the phrase is. Um, and the three stories, uh, the three cities I'll talk about here are all places that have hosted American troops uh, in the last couple of decades. Uh, we go into them with thoughts of transformation um, making them like us or making them like democracies. Uh, we tend to wreak a great deal of destruction in one way or another. We focus our attention on them like a laser beam. We learn about them. Uh, and then we leave. And the spotlight is withdrawn. Those places, as far as Americans are concerned, most Americans anyway, usually fall back into darkness. Uh, darkness over a good many ruins that we leave in our in our wake, um, and we move merrily on and talk about, at least some of us, the next war to come. And one of the things that struck me in the discussion about um, Iran is that the discussion of attacking this country of 80 million people, no one even seems to consider that it might in some way be risky or that somebody might get hurt, somebody, one of us even. Um, and it's an incredible thing, I think, at the heart of perhaps what it is to be an American to ignore that, um, but it seems to me it has its, its costs as well. Anyway, so in the service of uh, fighting slightly against the power of forgetting, I thought I'd read um, uh, a little bit of writing from, from three uh, different places. Uh, one is, is called Mornings in uh, Port-au-Prince. Uh, the other is um, from Srebrenica, a place we've talked about uh, recently a lot because of what's going on in Homs, Syria. And this piece is called Explosion in the Marketplace. Um, and the final one is called Autumns, uh, Autumns in Baghdad. Um, and I, I think if we uh, have a bit of time, um, I'll do something maybe a little uplifting, more uplifting from, from the fall where I spent in Ramallah. And I call this story unwritten, but uh, perhaps tellable, nonetheless, uh, Venus in Ramallah. Uh, so I'll hope to get to that um, as well. Okay, um, this, 
pieces written in, or from uh, Port-au-Prince during the transition to democracy, uh, which began in 86, which I was writing about a couple of years, uh, beginning in 86 and a couple of years later, and which is still going on <laughs> as we speak. Um, mornings in Port-au-Prince, just before dawn, as the last scattered gunshots faded in the distance and the outlines of the city began to take shape in the dirty air, Tiny houses painted aqua and salmon, the huge and ghostly national palace gleaming white, gray and rust-colored slums canopied in smoke. My colleagues and I would go off in search of bodies. This was during the days leading up to Sunday, November 29th, 1987, the day of the election that was to bring democracy to Haiti. Each morning, we would meet in the darkness in front of the Holiday Inn near the glass doors of a newly opened press center through which we could just make out banks of telephones and telexes and stacks of cheerful red and blue election press kits. During those last days, foreign correspondents and international observers and election experts poured into the country and the afternoons were filled with solemn press conferences. But the real story unfolded at night. It was a loud and violent conversation meant to be overheard. One followed its progress by charting the gunshots echoing over the city, then read the results by cruising the streets at daybreak to count the corpses. On the Tuesday before the election, we set out in the white early morning, skirting the Champ de Mar Park and passing beneath hundreds of little blue and red flags that hung limply from the telephone wires, celebrating Haiti's new democracy, and under banners stretched across the main streets, exhorting Haitians to vote. Following the brown smoke billowing in the distance, we drove slowly through the waking capital, and soon as we circled the perimeter of the great bidonville, the tin can city of La Saline, already covered over in brown cooking smoke and blurry in the rising heat, we found the first remnant of the night's conversation. Not far from rows of brightly colored camionettes, the tap-taps just in from the countryside, where shirtless sweating men were unloading baskets of mangoes and bunches of green bananas and great dirty bags of charcoal to feed the tens of thousands of cooking fires in the vast slum. We came upon a clump of chattering people, a sight in Haiti that week invariably meant a body. Pushing through the crowd, we discovered a tall, lean young man, several hours dead, laid out carefully on Haiti's route national, national number one. His body had been prepared for its role. A rope had been twisted about his neck, and above the frayed noose, a metal necklace had been pulled tight around his chin. But most of it had disappeared into the gaping maroon slashes around his mouth and throat. Distinct, deep machete cuts in a V-shaped pattern above and below the mouth. They seemed almost an attempt to construct for the victim after death a parody second mouth. A partly smoked cigarette had been placed between his lips, a charred wooden match balanced jauntily on his chin. With an easy reach next to his stomach, which left exposed was already dense with flies in the rising heat, were a handful of rice, a can of tomato sauce, and a slab of cheese, all displayed on a scrap of brown cardboard. That's so he can eat, an old man said laughing, bringing on the laughter of the crowd. And the cigarette, that's to keep him happy. There was no blood on his shirt, the old man said, because when they spotted him near La Saline Marketplace early that morning, as gunshots echoed in the distance, this tall young man had been wearing a dress, the all-purpose Haitian disguise, and carrying a can of gasoline. He was a tonto macoute, they said, a member of Jean-Claude Duvalier's militia, one of the thousands who had gone into hiding after the fall of the dictator nearly two years earlier, and who now, during the months of growing violence, had begun to reappear in, in the neighborhoods. He had come to spread terror by bringing to the people of La Saline what they dreaded most, a fire that in seconds would roar through the dense labyrinth of dry scrap wood hovels, leaving scores of people dead and thousands homeless. But the Brigade de Vigilance, neighborhood committees that had formed themselves in these last days of terror, had been watching. And when the Makut appeared in the dark and now deserted marketplace, wearing his dress and carrying his can of gasoline, the brigade slum boys let out a shout and gave chase, pursuing him down the tiny alleyways, over the ditches filled with pale green waste, until at last they caught him, dragging him to the ground beneath the black mountains of the vast charcoal yard. There, in front of the angry, shouting crowd, the slum boys stunned him with their machetes and lynched him. They prepared the body and left it on the road for Gede, the voodoo lord of the crossroads to the underworld, to attend to in his own good time. Fregede, despite his great power, often appears as a poor wandering beggar, 
a famished traveler who would be sure to look kindly on the sumptuous meal of rice and sauce and cheese that had been left beside the young man's lifeless hand. Fire was the chosen means of night terror in that election week. A few hours before dawn the previous day, a mob of men armed with heavy clubs had stormed into the Marche Salomon, a huge lofty building with concrete arches and a sheet metal roof that since the late 19th century had housed one of the city's main public markets. Shouting and screaming in the darkness, the men had used their clubs to beat the people sleeping there, and mostly market women in from the countryside who were guarding their precious mer merchandise and the usual complement of beggars. The men had chased them off, then carefully, methodically poured out their gasoline and torched the building. The enormous blaze roared until dawn, reddening the night sky and covering the capital in a pall of smoke that reeked of burned bananas and charred meat. At dawn, one could see amid the smoking rubble scores of beggars and market women staggering about, moaning and wailing as they picked through the tons of blackened, stinking food. I watched a frail, frail old man probe around, then straighten up and let out a shout. He held up a piece of charred meat in triumph before stuffing it into his mouth as his colleagues raced toward him through the rubble. A woman with a red kerchief on her head pulled something from the black waist and rose up straight, showing me what had once been her prized hen. By now, others had gathered around me, hoping that this white man with his notebook might be moved by their litany of losses and somehow make it right. I lost some beans and some bananas. I lost three chickens. I lost some beef. A little white-whiskered man in blue jeans and a white shirt cut short the voices. Yesterday, many people went to bed hungry, but today we'll have food, he said. He held up a burned piece of beef and gestured, grinning toward the black landscape. There's food in Haiti now, he said, because things are starting to boil. Um, this was a beginning of a week that led to an election that some of you may remember. Um, uh, it was you know, the entry into democracy, and in fact, it, it ended in a, a massacre, um, where a couple of hundred uh, uh, Haitians, 200 to 300, were killed, uh, mostly with, uh, with machetes, and a number of journalists were uh, simply meant, made to kneel down and, and assassinated on the street. Uh, three colleagues and I were almost killed with machetes as well, um, uh, and just through a stupid happenstance, we were, we were, we were let go. Uh, and I later learned the, this particular confrontation had been filmed by a CBS crew that was, <laughs> that was courageously hiding in the, uh, in the trees. <laughs> and they actually filmed it and showed it on CBS that night. Um, and my parents happened to see it, so my mother, uh, uh, my mother has never quite forgiven me for that, I don't think, but uh, I'm still, still working on it. Anyway, um, uh, I think we'll uh, leap forward a bit to a city that's been preoccupying me, or a place that's been preoccupying me a bit lately, uh, which is Srebrenica, or excuse me, uh, Sarajevo. Um, uh, Srebrenica also, uh, because Srebrenica uh, was a great, the great massacre of the Balkan Wars that I wrote about and that clearly had something to do with President Obama wanting to intervene in, in Libya uh, because there were fears that Benghazi, which was being encircled by Gaddafi's forces, would become a second Srebrenica. Uh, so it's amazing to me the way these uh, particular stories seem to intersect and, and stay present in one way or another. And Sarajevo lately has been in the discussion, I think, because of what's going on in Homs. Uh, in Syria, uh, um, uh, where a couple of uh, journalists uh, were killed last week, uh, including a friend of mine, Marie Colvin, um, whose transmissions out of uh, reporting out of homes were, were tracked by the Syrian army, and they, uh, they bombed the house and killed her and a, and a colleague. Um, so the discussion about Sarajevo at the time uh, was very much about what are, after the Cold War, we're talking about, for those of you who don't remember, Roughly the years 90, 91 to 95. And the great debate really was what are the, okay, this genocide is going on and we're watching it on television. Uh, and what are, is the responsibility of the US and the West after the, uh, after the Cold War? The Cold War had ended. Uh, civilians were being massacred, 100,000 or more. Uh, and in fact, at a certain point during the campaign of 1992 between George H.W. Bush and Governor Clinton, uh, 
there were actually broadca broadcasts of footage from Omarska, which was a concentration camp uh, in northern Bosnia, where several thousand people, certainly tens of thousands maybe, died. Uh, and we finally had the answer to the question of what would have happened, what would the West have done if there had been television cameras in Auschwitz? And from those broadcasts, uh, we can perhaps infer that the answer to that is nothing, because uh, uh, nothing did happen. In any case, um, I want to read something from uh, the marketplace uh, in, in, uh, in Sarajevo, where I was reporting actually for ABC News for Peter Jennings uh, reporting. We did, a, we did a documentary on this, on this, so we were filming that day. Um, it's called Explosion in the Marketplace. Early one unseasonably mild afternoon in February 1994, Sarajevans shed their heavy coats and hats and poured out into the streets and markets, allowing themselves to forget in the bright warming sun that from artillery bunkers and sniper's nests dug into hills and mountains above the city, hunters stared down, tracking their prey. But the people of Sarajevo were not permitted to forget. As we cruised the city streets in a small armored car, Climbing under a trembling light-filled sky toward the Spanish fort, signs fell abruptly into space. Excuse me, signs fell abruptly into place. A sudden chaos of horns and screams and screeching tires. A blue van tearing by with one eye peering out from a shattered face. And racing in its wake, a battered white yuga with a smeared red handprint emblazoned on its door. We turned and forced our way back, struggling to trace the source of this grim caravan. When a policeman bade us stop, we clambered out and trotted down cluttered streets, dodging and stumbling through jumbles of honking vehicles until we entered once more the tiny square where the day before we had edged our way through boisterous crowds, chatting with vendors behind bare wood tables that had held the besieged city's paltry wares, handfuls of leeks and potatoes, plastic combs in garish pink and green, scatterings of loose nuts and bolts, a blackened bit of banana, a monkey wrench half rusted, glinting fitfully in the beneficent sun. 24 hours later, the Markella, the marketplace, stood precisely so when at 1237 on February 5th, 1994, a 120 meter mortar shell, 120 millimeter mortar shell plunged earthward in an impossibly perfect trajectory, plummeted within view of the somber gray facade of the Catholic Cathedral and by the windows of gray apartment buildings, passed through the market's ramshackle metal roof and erupted its five pounds of high explosives spewing out red hot shrapnel and sending corrugated metal shards slicing through the crowd. In an eye blink, a thick forest of chattering, gossiping, bartering people had been cut down. Turning into the tiny square, we found not infernal smoke or darkness, but amid a terrible clarity, clumps of dark bundles strewn about the asphalt and between them spreading slowly amid shards of charred metal and blackened vegetables and bits of plastic, puddles of slick, dark liquid. We stepped gingerly forward, letting pass two men dragging a limp, softly moaning figure. Before us, men moved from bundle to bundle, crouching, pressing fingers to a throat, pausing, pushing back an eyelid, staring. I left the curb, feeling my throat constrict as I passed into a cloud of invisible and nauseating cordite. Slipping and stumbling against a car, I looked down and saw my boot soles already shiny and slick. A big man danced quickly by me, hoisting the video camera on his shoulder, and close at his back came sound, craning his silver boom forward over the cameraman's head so that the two together appeared like some great rapacious bird. I placed my hand on the sound man's back and followed step by careful step, and we three passed through the bloody topography, tracing our way slowly past torsos, and parts of torsos, past arms and hands and bits of limbs and unidentifiable hunks of flesh, all mixed with blackened metal and smashed vegetables and here and there a long splinter of wooden table. At the center of it all, a man in a dark overcoat lay on his back fully intact, face perfectly gray, eyes perfectly empty, empty staring blankly up at the perfect sky. I gripped my pen and notebook and looked about me somewhat bewildered. Here and there I recognized, or thought I did, vendors I had chatted with the day before. Some artillery man on one of those mountainsides had made objects of them now, exhibits for us in the evening news. I tried to tally the corpses, matching limbs to trunks, heads to limbs, counting, counting, but it was impossible. In the back of the market, three blank-faced men work, worked with black-gloved hands behind a decrepit truck, crouching, lifting, heaving, 
As I approached, I realized they were trying to match up parts of bodies on long pieces of corrugated metal. By now, the truck bed was half full and its tires and undercarriage were thick with gore. Turning back, I saw a big mustached man weeping, his hands raised and grasping the air as he struggled to reach a blood-soaked bundle of cloth and flesh on the ground. Two smaller men held him back, murmuring softly to him, working to push him back. As the mustached face, red and distorted and full of f fury, rose above the shoulders of those imprisoning him, I realized that I had chatted with him the day before, that he had been selling what? Yes, lentils, that was it, lentils and potatoes. And his wife, now at his feet, has stood at his side. Now he lifted his great head, stared upward, and raising a fist, began to shout. Along with several others, I followed his gaze and picked out the glinting specks in the bright blue sky, the plains of NATO patrolling over the safe area of Sarajevo. Amid the humid wreckage of the sun-filled square, what could the phrase possibly mean, safe area? Since United Nations diplomats had coined it the previous spring, no one had quite known. Now amid the stench of cordite in Sarajevo's Markella, the world had at last been offered the hint of a definition. Safe area meant very little. It was a pretense, a policy of gesture, made slowly of words. Now large glass lenses, more and more of them bobbing and glinting as ever more cameramen pushed their way into the tiny square, would make those words flesh. A few hundred miles away, Germans and French would press a button on a remote control and confront overwhelming gore. Across the ocean, Americans, with presumably more delicate sensibilities, would be permitted to see much less. But enough blood would remain for many of these citizens to pose a heartfelt, if ephemeral, question. Why is nothing being done about this? Though the S Serbs had shelled Sarajevo for nearly two years, though they had destroyed the National Library, burning hundreds of thousands of books, and had methodically reduced to ruins many of the city's other cultural treasures, though they had cut off electricity and water, forcing Sarajevans to place themselves in snipers' telescopic sights as they chopped down every tree in every park in search of firewood and stood in line fill filling plastic bottles at outdoor water spigots, Though the Serbs had killed and wounded thousands of Sarajevans from their bunkers in the hills and from their snipers' nests in the burned out high rise buildings that lined Snipers Alley, after two years of siege, only an event like the Marketplace Massacre had a chance of engaging the fickle attention of the world. The day before, the Serbs had launched three shells into the Dobrinja neighborhood, killing 10 Sarajevans as they waited for food. 12 days before, two Serb shells had land, blown apart six children as they sledded in the filthy snow. How many days of such steady, methodical killing would be needed to match the marketplace's toll? Six, seven? And yet such daily work, however deadly, didn't matter. For depending on the news in New York or London and Paris, it did not raise to the level, rise to the level of massacre. I stood in the morgue across the road from Kosovo Hospital. Compared to the blood slick ground of the Markella, compared even to the hospital entrance, a hellhole with shattered figures dead and dying in the hallways, and a doctor, face brightly flushed, furious, screaming at us, Get out! Get out, I said. Let us do our work. Never really felt so sleazy as a reporter. Uh, compared to that, it was quiet here, peaceful. I found myself alone for the first time that day alone in the morgue, alone with those who had suddenly become the most important actors in the Bosnia drama. It was they who had forced reluctant politicians and diplomats to come together. Even now in Washington and Brussels and Paris, they were gathering for urgent talks, and they who in the next few days would change the direction of the war. And yet they'd done nothing more than thousands of Sarajevans before them, stood in a particular place at a particular time, and all unknowingly unknow found a sudden and unforeseen death. I took out my notebook, drew a deep breath, and began to count. It was easier now. All had been properly arranged. What limbs and parts remained had been matched up by people well-practiced in such things. 21, 22, 23. Yes, this was a big story, perhaps the biggest of the war. 31, 32. Yes, a huge story. Uh, Um, let me just read a, a, couple, a day after this, I went up to Pale, which was the uh, Bosnian uh, Serb capital, which is sort of a ski chalet uh, up above the city, um, and had uh, interviewed Radovan Karatic, who was the guy shelling the, uh, 
Sarajevo, and had been a resident of Sarajevo. It was a very small town, everybody knew one another. He was a psychiatrist, still is. He's now on trial in The Hague, um, and a, uh, a poet uh, who had been rejected by Sarajevo's co cosmopolitan audience when he did his poetry readings. So beware, beware. Um, <laughs> and uh, I went up to see him, and I'll read just a brief part of that. Uh, many had ice in their ears. What? Excuse me? Ice. They had ice in their ears, said Dr. Radovan Karatic, psychiatrist, poet, businessman, leader of the Bosnian Serbs, as he prepared to take another bite of stew. You know, the Muslims, they took bodies from the morgue and they put them there in the market. Even when they shell themselves like this, no one shell kills that many. So they went to the morgue and they had ice in their ears. <clears throat> I was, and this was sort of the day out, two days after I actually, the scene I described to you, um, this lunch. I was, and not for the first time during our lunch, left speechless. Dr. Karatic, clearly a very intelligent man, had mastered the fine art of constructing and delivering with great sincerity utterances that seemed so distant from demonstrable reality that he left no common ground on which to contradict him. Ice in their ears. Muslim intelligence officers stealing into the morgue to snatch cor corpses, secreting them in cars, setting off a bomb in the marketplace, and in the smoke and confusion, leaving the frozen corpses strewn about the asphalt. It seemed an absurd idea. My memories of the gore of the Markella only two days before were precise and vivid, and yet I found myself thinking of the man in the overcoat lying on his back, staring upward open-eyed. His face was peculiarly gray. Strangely, he bore no evident wounds. Ice in his ears? No, no, of course not. Dr. Karatic watched me, lightly smiled. He's a psychiatrist. Uh, took a bite of stew and chewed heartily. He was a hearty man, enormous, wide as the side of a barn and standing six foot four. In fact, he appeared taller than that and this is clearly owing to his trademark hair. The hair is huge. The hair is sweeping and all encompassing. It seems to be emerging from everywhere, head, forehead, ears, nose, in a kind of riot of power and fertility. And indeed, though he lived in Sarajevo 30 years, took his psych psychiatric degree at the university and practiced in Kosovo Hospital when he wasn't studying medicine and dabbling in poetry for a year in New York, though he recited and sang his poetry in the cafes and bars of this most cosmopolitan city, the Bosnian capital, Radovan Karatic was in fact a man of the mountains from a small and rough Montenegrin village. Radovan has a sense of grandiosity like many mountain people. Um, sorry, I won't continue to do that. <laughs> I interviewed uh, Karatic uh, the day after the uh, Markella itself, I interviewed his uh, training psychiatrist, his training al analyst, I guess they're called, uh, Dr. Sarich, who said, um, you know, Radovan has a sense of grandiosity that has never been satisfied which, uh, you know, and he was there essentially trying to stitch up these bodies that his former uh, 2T or Anna Sand had, uh, had blown apart. So anyway, um, let me read a little bit from, uh, uh, from Baghdad, a more recent uh, occurrence, and then perhaps a word from Ramallah. And, um, uh, and I'm happy to talk about any of these places or answer any questions about reporting or, I mean, it strikes me just reading these that, you know, <laughs> they sound so terribly grim, and yet um, there's great pleasure in reporting. It's a funny um, paradox. Uh, and one of the strange things about reporting is the more you learn, the less you know. Um, and it is a strange, you know, from the point of view of foreign policy and the way I began talking about Iran, if there's one lessons I've, lesson I've learned is that we go into these places and we know nothing about them. Uh, uh, and they become more obscure, the better, the more you learn about them, the more complicated they become. And the more complicated the kind of hyd hydraulics of their politics become. Uh, and the notion that you can go in and remove Saddam and everything will be fine, uh, the failure to see that Saddam was a product of political dis dysfunction, of complicated political dysfunction, not the cause of it. Um, sort of passes over Americans. It doesn't fit into their worldview, that sort of thinking. Um, anyway, I don't mean to sermonize. Let me read just a little bit from Baghdad, and uh, this is Autumn's, Autumn's in Baghdad. The first sentence actually comes from a Nabokov story, for those of you who 
our Nabokov fancier, Spring and, Spring and Fialta, one of my favorite stories. Um, autumn in Baghdad is cloudy and gray. Trapped in rush hour traffic one October morning, without warning, my car bucks up and back like a horse whose reins had been brutally pulled. For a jolting instant, the explosion registers only as an absence of sound, a silent blow in the stomach. And then a beat later, as the hearing returns, a faint tick tinkling chorus. The store windows, all along busy Karata Street, trembling together in their sashes. They were tinkling still when over the rooftops to the right came the immense eruption of oily black smoke. Such dark plumes have become the beacons, the lighthouses of contemporary Baghdad. And we rushed to follow, bumping over the center divider, vaulting the curb, screeching through the honking chaos of 70s vintage American cars, trailing the blasting horns and screaming tires for two, three, four heart-pounding moments until barely three blocks away, at one end of a pleasant residential street behind a gaggle of blue-shirted Iraqi security men running in panic about the grass, shouting, waving their AK-47s, we came upon two towering conflagrations, ri rising perhaps a dozen feet in the air and, and perfectly outlined in the bright orange flames, like skeletons preserved in amber, the black, blackened frames of what moments before had been a van and a four-wheel drive. Between the two great fires rose a smaller one, eight or nine feet high, enclosing a tangled mass of metal. Pushing past the Iraqis who shouted angrily, gesturing with their guns, I ran forward toward the flames. The heat was intense. I saw slabs of smashed wall, hunks of rubble, glass, and sand scattered about, and behind it all an immense curtain of black smoke, smoke obscuring everything. The building, part of the International Red Cross compound that stood there, the wall that had guarded it, the remains of the people who, four minutes before had lived and worked there. Terrorism, as a US Army Lieutenant Colonel had told me ruefully the week before, is grand theater. And as a mustache security man yanked me roughly by the arm, spinning me away from the flames, I saw that behind me the front rows had quickly filled. Photographers with their long lenses, khaki vests, and shoulder bags struggled to push their way through the Iraqi security men who, growing angrier, shouted and cursed, pushing them back. Swinging their AK-47s, they managed to form a ragged perimeter against what was now a jostling, roiling crowd, while camera crews in the vanguard surged forward. Now a US Army Humvee appeared. Four American soldiers leapt out and plunged into the crowd, assault rifles raised, and began to scream in what I had come to recognize as a characteristic form of address. Get the f back. Get the f back. This seems to be a kind of chorus that's taught them or something. It's, you know, <laughs> I haven't heard it anywhere else, but uh, not yet on the Berkeley campus anyway. Uh, very young men in tan cam camouflage fatigues, armed, red-faced, flustered, facing them, the men and women of the world press, Baghdad division, assembled in their hundreds in less than a quarter of an hour. In the front row, those who, like me, had had the dumb luck to be in the neighborhood, Behind them, network crews who had received a quick tip from an embassy contact or an Iraqi stringer, or had simply heard or felt the explosion and pounded their way up to the hotel roof, scanning the horizon anxiously, locating the black beacon, and racing off to cover the story. Or as Colonel George Crevo had put it to me bitterly, to quote, make the story. Here, media is the total message. I now have an understanding of McLuhan you wouldn't believe. Kill 20 people here. In front of that lens, it's killing 20,000. The officers were very bitter about what they felt was a pacified city. Um, they couldn't understand how the killing of 100 people could have such an effect. Um, and they remained this way, the officers anyway, not the soldiers. Uh, behind the flames and the dark smoke, amid the shattered walls and twisted metal, a dozen people lay dead, many of whom had been unlucky enough to find themselves passing the front of the International Red Cross compound uh, when at half past eight in the morning, a man later claimed to be of Saudi nationality, drove an ambulance with Red Cross markings up to the security checkpoint and detonated what must have been several thousand tons, pounds, excuse me, of explosives, collapsing 40 feet of the protective wall and sending a huge sandbag barrier cascading forward. The Red Cross compound with, with its security wall and sandbags and manned checkpoints was a hardened target as were indeed the three police stations that within the next 45 minutes, suicide bombers struck in the Baghdad neighborhoods of Al-Baya, Al-Shahab, and Al-Khadra. Um, 
this was the beginning of the so-called uh, Ramadan offensive in 2003, which is the first multi-suicide uh, bombing day in Baghdad, where you had five suicide bombers striking separate targets. And um, uh, it was really akin to the Tet Offensive in some ways, uh, obviously quite different in other ways. But, um, uh, and it announced really, there was, still in Washington, Rumsfeld and others were denying that uh, a guerrilla war was going on or an insurgency, and this, in a sense, made it impossible for them uh, to deny it any longer. Um, the day before, there had been a shelling of uh, a hotel in the green zone, this remarkable act of, I mean, it was kind of a brilliant act where this little rocket launcher had been hidden in a generator and left on the street and sighted in right under an American machine gun post. Uh, and blew up part of the building and nearly killed Paul Wolfowitz, came within a room uh, of killing him. Uh, and the Americans later claimed that, because his visit had been secret, that this was just by chance, but it, it clearly wasn't. They clearly had uh, leaks. Um, oh. In the rhetoric of security, all of these attacks failed dismally. From what our indications are, Brigadier General Mark Hurtling told Fox News that afternoon, none of these bombers got close to the target. In the rhetoric of politics, however, the attacks were a brilliant coup de théâtre. In less than an hour, four men, by killing 40 people, including one American soldier and 20 Iraqi police, had succeeding in dominating, in, succeeded in dominating news coverage around the world, sending television crews rushing about Baghdad in pursuit of the largest plume of smoke and broadcasting the message via television screens in 100 countries, first and foremost the United States, that Baghdad, U.S. official pronouncements notwithstanding, remained a war zone. Within a week, as members of the Red Cross left Iraq and many of the few remaining international organizations followed close behind, the attackers had set in motion at the highest levels of the Bush administration a revaluation of American policy. Within two weeks, even as President Bush went on vowing publicly that the United States would not be intimidated, he abruptly recalled L. Paul Bremer, the American administrator in Iraq, who rushed back to Washington so hurriedly he left the Prime Minister of Poland, one of America's few major allies in Iraq, waiting forlornly for an appointment that never came. Um, when I arrived in Baghdad, Iraqi insurgents were staging about 15 attacks a day on American troops. By the time I left, the number of daily attacks had more than doubled to 35 a day. Um, actually, I think um, I will stop that there. Um, I, the one thing I would like to say um, uh, is that being a reporter, I mean, it's funny, you know, when you try to read narrative from reporting, it tends to be, or at least from my work, it tends to be violent because the violence often forms climactic points in the writing and tends to be the parts that stand alone as, as stories. My first book, The Massacre at El Masote, uh, the publisher on the book tour uh, insisted that I do readings at each spot. And the problem is the only part of the book that actually could be read in one portion was the massacre itself. So I found myself during three weeks, and book tours, you know, you, you are insane operations, as I'm sure Vikram and others in this room know. You get up in the morning at six o'clock, you get on a plane, you fly somewhere, you then make seven appearances. And I found myself reading incessantly the scene of this massacre. Um, and um, uh, it drove me nearly uh, nearly mad. Um, uh, but I have to say that, you know, reporting itself, I found it, find to be an astonishing uh, thing to do, a hard, very hard in a way, because it requires a kind of uh, intrepid uh, question asking part of yourself to come forward that I'm not necessarily terribly comfortable with. Um, but astonishing as an intellectual matter, because it, it does become, if you're here and you're reading about Iraq or one of these other places, uh, you don't realize it, but the reporting that you read, even if you uh, are very closely following it, will tend to be some conclusions that are passed on to you by people on the scene. And uh, when you arrive, you confront this blizzard of sense impressions, not only what hundreds of people will tell you is going on, many of their versions being diametrically opposed to one another, but just sense, senses, you know, what it looks like. Uh, the astonishing look uh, 
um, for example, of, of, of Baghdad. Um, in fact, I'm gonna read one paragraph about that. Um, uh, autumn in Baghdad is sunny and bright. Drive, drive about the bustling city of tan, sun-dried brick, and you will hear the noise of honking horns and see crowded markets, the streets overwhelmed by an enormous post-war expansion of traffic, the sidewalks cluttered with satellite disks and other new products flooding into the newly opened Iraqi market. During the last several months, however, a new city has taken root amid these busy streets and avenues, spreading rapidly as it superimposes itself over the old tan brick metropolis, a new grim city of concrete. It is constructed of 12-foot-high gray concrete barriers, endless roadblocks manned by squads of men with Kalashnikovs, walls of enormous steel-reinforced bags of earth and rubble, and mile upon mile of coiled razor wire, and studded here and there with tanks rooted behind sandbags and watchful soldiers in combat fatigues. This city has a vaguely postmodern apocalyptic feel, a bit of Belfast here, a bit of Cyprus there, here and there a sprinkling of West Bank, as one network cameraman put it to me. Many streets, including several of the grand ceremonial avenue of Saddam's capital, are now entirely lined with raw concrete a dozen feet high, giving the driver the impression of advancing down a stone tube. Behind those walls, entire chunks of Baghdad have effectively vanished. Notably, the great park and building complex that had housed Saddam's Republican palace and now comprises the so-called Green Zone, a four and a half square mile concrete bunker that has at its heart the headquarters of the coalition provisional authority. To enter the palace, you must secure first an appointment, hard to get and made immeasurably harder by the fact that most members of the CPA are difficult or impossible to reach by telephone, and then make your way down several hundred yards of sidewalk lined with razor wire. Your journey will be broken by three checkpoints, two military, concrete cordons, sandbags, machine guns, and one civilian. At two of these, you present two identifications and submit to full body searches, standing with your legs parted and arms extended and staring straight ahead in a ritual I found myself repeating on a busy day in Baghdad a dozen times. Finally, after securing, a, securing an identification bag, you wait for a military escort to drive you to the palace where yet another series of checks and searches will be performed. Inside Saddam's Republican palace, his huge likeness in the central atrium is discreetly masked by a large blue cloth. You will find amid the dark marble floors and sconces and chandeliers a great many Americans striding purposefully about, some in uniform but many in casual civilian clothing, chinos, jeans, sport shirts. They look bright, crisp, self-assured, and extremely young. They look, in other words, like what they are, junior staffers from Washington, from the Capitol, the departments, and various agencies and think tanks. After all the combat fatigues on the street, it is a bit of a shock to find this great horde of young American civilians secreted in Saddam's marble-lined hideaway, now become Baghdad's own Emerald City. Anyway, I was saying that the astonishments of reporting have to do, I think, with sort of perceiving these things, having them come upon you in this wave, uh, and then trying, when you realize, when you reach this delicious point, that having known exactly what was going on in Baghdad when you were back in the US, knowing exactly what Iraq was like, knowing exactly what you thought of it, you reach the point after a week or so on the scene, whether it's Baghdad or somewhere else, that you just know nothing. You realize you know nothing. You have no idea. Um, and that's a, a point to reach that is gorgeous, that's kind of wonderful, that's, that's, uh, that's worth it all. And then you try to construct out of that nothingness what you think and what you want to write and what you want to describe. So in a sense, you're armed in a way with your own ignorance. Um, and it's what uh, I love most about um, reporting uh, from these places, I guess, which is to answer my mother's question why I don't go somewhere nice for a change. Um, my Ramallah story. Well, um, I'd be happy to give you my Ramallah story. I'm, I'm, I'm sad my friend uh, Bob Hass, who's my morning gym partner, God, God bless him, wakes me up every morning at 7.40 with, good morning, I'm ready if you are, he says. God bless him, that's the blessing, one of the blessings of my day. I told him this story and um, he said, you should use that at the end. Uh, because indeed it is from another place, uh, Ramallah, a city I love, like the other cities I've mentioned, from Port-au-Prince to uh, 
to Sarajevo to Baghdad. Um, and I would call it Venus in, in Ramallah, and it's, it's, it's short. It begins with a scene in a Ramallah apartment, uh, fifth floor, uh, my Ramallah apartment, looking out over the hills over Ramallah, um, uh, where many high rises are going up because of what's called the five star occupation. That is, if we don't give you uh, the vote, if we don't give you freedom, if we don't take down the checkpoints, we'll pour money in. We'll let more money pour in, actually, from the European community, the US, and elsewhere. So you have these, these buildings going up, most of which are unfinished. They're shells uh, up on these verdant uh, Ramallah hills. It's quite extraordinary uh, sight. And um, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, someone I came to know uh, this fall, who, who she taught uh, Victorian literature, actually, uh, <laughs> in the English department of Al-Quds University uh, in East Jerusalem. And Al-Quds is in Abu Dis, which is part of Jerusalem, but it is divided from Jerusalem by the wall. So outside my window where I worked and where I taught, the gray wall stood. And if you wanted to go into Jerusalem, though it was had been literally three minutes away by foot, you now, had, you now had to take a bus, go through checkpoints, and it, took, it could take an hour, actually. And most of my students had never been to Jerusalem, uh, though indeed it was right on the other side of this wall. Um, uh, anyway, this colleague of mine was, we were discussing gods and goddesses, and we were discussing Allah and uh, uh, Judaism and um, Christianity. We we're having this discussion, and she walked by this picture window, um, <laughs> and... Um, I said, uh, you, you make me think of other gods and goddesses. And she said, which? And I said, uh, Venus Calipigia. She was wearing, I don't want to offend anyone here, but she was wearing um, uh, extremely tight uh, black tights, which had become fashionable in, uh, on the West Bank, among some very few people. Uh, not most, but very few. It's amazing, the combination of headscarf and tights. It's an incredible phenomenon. It's very, again, this is under the heading of how marvelous it is to actually go and be bewildered by the complications that you didn't anticipate. So I said, v Venus Calipigia. Uh, and we went on, and I started working at my desk, and she sat down on the couch and started working at her computer. And a few moments later, she started to laugh, and uh, she started to read a sentence that she had found, which began, um, that was another one of the numerous traits about Nurse Duckett that Yosarian enjoyed. He enjoyed Nurse Sue Ann Duckett's long white legs. Anyway, at that point, as she started to read this quotation, someone at least is getting this. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, that's from Catch-22. Um, and I started to laugh. And what happened instantly was a kind of strange time phenomenon uh, that happens sometimes where you get telescoping images back through your history, back through your mind. And the first of these telescoping images was of myself sitting as a 17-year-old in the great halls of Widener Library of Harvard University, leaning back in an easy chair, not unlike one of these, with my feet up in an ottoman, clearly, as I look back at myself at that moment, uh, uh, procrastinating, not doing what I was supposed to be doing at that given time, and reading a particular book, Catch-22, and reaching that very s sentence, and then, to the disgust of everyone around me, bursting into laughter. And the reason I burst into laughter was because my mind at that moment as a 17-year-old had gone backward instantly, the kind of backward lurch that, uh, or backward transformation that Proust describes so well and so much more elegantly than I am when he talks about the dipping of the Madeleine cookie into the tea and biting into it and finding his whole past revealed. Because in that instant, my mind had gone back and I was suddenly looking at my father and I was looking at him from a height down and I was seeing him in an easy chair uh, where I'd seen him night after night the whole time I was a small child sitting in this kind of red easy chair in our living room with his feet up on an ottoman reading a book and laughing. And he had said to me a moment before I'd been lying, I was seven, eight years old, I was lying on the, the carpet in front of him as I often did, reading my book, probably the Hardy Boys or something. And he had said to me, Marky, Marky, go to the dictionary. 
I loved it when he did that. And I got up and I ran to the back of the living room and I climbed up on the window seat and I climbed up on the shelf and I climbed up to the bookcase, uh, as you do when you're seven or eight years old. And I stood there swaying back and forth and I reached up and I brought down the enormous Webster Dictionary and I pulled it down and I read to him as he spelled out a word for me, calipigia, and I read to him, and he hadn't laughed or anything, he was just asking me the word. I read to him, Kala, beautiful, Pigia, Greek, buttocks, of or having beautiful buttocks. <laughs> At which point my father had burst into laughter because he was reading that very sentence that Yossarian enjoyed Nurse, Nurse Sue Ann Duckett's long white legs and supple calipigious ass. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> So at that moment, I was back seven years old, I was 17 years old, and I was uh, 52 years old in, in uh, Ramallah with my friend in the black tights. And she was laughing and I was laughing, and I thought this is how I want to uh, remember Ramallah, and this is how I want to bring tonight's event to a beautiful, perfect, and curvaceous <laughs> end. <laughs> Thank you.